And we're good to go. Hello Yeehaw. to our growing list of subscribers, which is quite fun and exciting. And to anybody... What are, what are we up to? Uh, last time I checked, we were up to seven, which is cool. And there's some people in Yeehaw. there that, you know, isn't my mum. Uh, although, to, <laughs> to be honest, my mum has not subscribed, but I don't know if she even has a YouTube chat, uh, account. So that's by the way. Uh, if you are watching this... And you're keen to keep getting this, do subscribe uh, because this is coming every week. Yeah, hit that button. Which side am I on? Smash the like <laughs> button, uh, absolutely decimate the bell, and, you know, slowly torture the subscribe button over the course of eight weeks. I don't, why are people so violent with that? You know, why are you smashing the Energy. like button? Just, Energy. I just think click it. Just, just click it, people. Don't question. This is, they have more subscribers than us. So That's true. Question it. That's true. Well, to be fair, my personal YouTube account that has no videos posted has more subscribers than us right now. So, you know, you got to start somewhere, uh, as our friend Drake would say. Um, anyway, fifth episode, man. It's good. We're getting through them. We've been pretty I consistent. Thought it was the sixth episode, but that's our password for this episode to join. Oh uh, yeah. Group and if you us. are somehow watching this live, which is impossible, but episode ten will be live. I promise you that. I uh, don't have anyone to watch. Maybe my mom will. Uh, anyway, episode five. We're back. Uh, we did it. As, yeah. I, I mean, one of the things Tom was saying to me before the show started was uh, we the one thing we should work on is our introduction. So hopefully you guys thought that, you know, that last two and a half minutes of us rambling was an improvement because that's the grand sum of our... Uh, our work uh it, it's all downhill from that uh yeah nah anyway what are we talking about this week tom what are you talking um yeah what are we talking about um so i i instead of randomly stumbling across something this week i actually went and searched for something um uh, i've been sitting with this question around the idea of incubation uh in problem solving and like letting a letting a problem sit in your head basically in a hammock and like or... does that make yeah in a hammock in your head in a hammock um does that make it uh does that make it more likely to be solved solved better something like that um so i went and found a paper that was a really good read on and it's entitled does incubation enhance problem solving so i think i found the answer i look forward to hearing that i didn't read a paper this week i stumbled across something but i it, it was interesting uh and uh it's kind of topical uh, so there throughout covid there were a number of virtual health solutions that popped up in the u.s that were aimed at diagnosing mental health conditions and prescribing medication uh, because people just couldn't access those services during those times and it came out this week that one of them is under investigation by the DEA for improperly prescribing controlled substances. And I think it's a fascinating idea of, you know, where does the balance of power in these services lie? Should we have them? Should people have to go in in person? And I figured it's worth talking about, especially given, you know, we run a virtual health company. We don't prescribe drugs, but uh, yeah. Felt topical, and it's uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. You know, I'm I'm not looking to name and shame that particular company. I don't know what the outcome's going to be. And the article listed, I think, like half a dozen companies that are all running that same business model. So it's by no means unique to this one group. But uh, yeah, but before we do that, oh God, we will name we will name and shame them. Yeah, I can remember some of the names. Um, <laughs> what? What beverage do you have today? I've got uh, this whiskey. That is the focal point of my oh, camera, not my face. Okay, good work, Elliot. Uh, it is, and if you are Scottish, cover your ears now. Uh, it is Glenmorangie Ten Year. I don't know how to say that word, but maybe no one does. Uh, it's quite good. It's probably the first scotch I ever had. That wasn't like, you know, some dirty scotch and coke at Drinking 2 a.m. session with, yeah, 
Yeah, the the first scotch I probably drank on its own. Uh, and I had a bottle of it unopened, so I thought I'd crack it open for this evening. I'm not, <laughs> not the whole oh, bottle. Is that the bottle that you bought me for? <laughs> Was that the bottle that you bought me when I looked after your cats? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a good, good drop. Yeah. Um, this morning I have uh, the mutt equivalent of coffee where I didn't have enough of any coffee to make oh. a single coffee from it. So we have a little bit of uh, store-bought random <laughs> Waitrose own brand. Yeah, yeah Blend 43 <laughs> mixed with uh, my El Cap, my El Cap uh, Capitivo or whatever it was called from last week, mixed with a spoonful of decaf because I didn't have enough of either. So uh, I made French press style. Um, so yeah. Mate, honestly, with that fucking hodgepodge, it doesn't matter how you made it. You could have punched the beans and poured hot water over the top. It's not going to turn out that well, is it? <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, it's uh, I'm here. I it didn't. It didn't kill then, him, uh, guys. That's the re the reviews are in. Won't kill you. Ten yeah, out of ten. Yeah. yeah, but anyway. So that's what I'm drinking this morning. So not my mm -hmm. finest moment, but that's all right. Vegas can't be choosers. It it is surprising how often. The, so I've got this like weekly, not weekly, but like every ten day coffee order coming through. It is surprising mm -hmm. how many times that it gets delivered. About an hour after I've made it, like struggled to make a coffee like this every week. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, at this point, it's like, I should really learn to have one less coffee in the week. So I will, so I can, uh, or I should, or they just need to be better. They, it's their fault. They need to be better. Yeah. They should know when you're down to the blend 43, they should know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a blend 40, blend 43 kind of Friday. I had a job when I was, uh, in high school, like grade ten or something, it was at a uh, at a podiatrist. Uh, it's, it's kind of a gross job when I look back on it. So, like, I would go there after the end of the day, and I just had to like clean all the surgical instruments and put them in the autoclave um, with gloves on and stuff. So, like, it was gross, but not that gross. Uh, but it was like three or four hours a day, uh, and the only like food or snacks or whatever was just this tub of Nescafe blend 43 and I would just make cup after cup after cup after cup waiting for this like it was like this single so it's like microwave size autoclave uh so you'd steam like two bags of tools at once and you'd have like 300 bags to go through in the night so you just sit there wait and do that and I, man I must have drunk my body weight in Nescafe blend 43 like every week <laughs> For like eight dollars an hour or something, you, you got fired for stealing the blend forty three. When in reality, you were just drinking it. <laughs> what um, what surgery do podiatrists do? That need uh, it sounds like a dentist. It's a lot of like clipping toenails Scraping. and cutting Ew. back dead skin on feet and stuff. Well, I mean, like it's kind of gross when you say it that way, but like I don't know, it's a lot of elderly people and like people that just would have a lot of trouble doing that for themselves. So. It's a valuable service. Not something I wanted to do. Um, I just had to clean up the mess. Oh, man, this doesn't sound better. Um, but eventually I that podiatry did. closed down and was replaced by a bakery, and then I worked there. I yeah. never knew either of these things. Yeah, washing dishes. Yeah. Just washing stuff, I guess, is my skill set. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uniquely qualified <laughs> to just wash things. That's what you do at Maxwell Plus. Mm. Yeah. Wash data. Anyway, I just, that analogy is stupid. Um, so, do you think we nailed the intro this week? Oh yeah, this is great. Ramble. I mean, yeah, people definitely. The one thing I've learned about YouTube content creation is people want to wait ten minutes to get into the content. Like, yeah, this is why yeah. this is why we have chapters, and by have chapters, I mean one day we'll do chapters. I'll do chapters. I'll do chapters from this episode. Uh, but in exchange, you're on show note duty. 
and that yeah, seems like I'll a sure reasonable that. exchange. I mean, neither of them are particularly yeah. hard. Yeah, good. Well, if the show notes suck, blame Tom. If the chapters don't work, you can blame me. Uh, anyway, start of chapter one. Bing. Bing. Yeah. So, you wrote a paper. I read a paper. I haven't read a paper in a while. I'm not really a paper reading guy. I'm more of a let people other other people tell me that they read a paper and then not the check threads. whether they actually read the paper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I wanted to like, I wanted to see whether this idea, like we've talked about it in episode two and episode four about this idea of like uh, the letting a problem sit and percolate in your brain. Um, the the science calls it incubation, which I guess is a good word, but yeah, yeah, we'll go with that. So the idea of like basically looking at a problem and coming back later, is that good? Does that help with solving problems? Um, and in naturally in a lot of science, there is conflicting papers either way, especially in this, mm, uh, especially psychology. this field where, yeah. Um, but I found a paper and the reason why I chose to look at this paper was that it was a meta-analysis of 117 mm. studies Good man. Across 3,600 procedures. Uh, sorry, procedures, participants, podiatrists. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. And so uh, they really just set out to understand whether incubation is a thing, which I liked. I was like, cool, good, good paper. It was, it, it was called, it does incubation enhance problem solving, question mark, a meta analytic review. And it's by... I'm really sorry. I, I'm also going to send her an email at some point, but Utna Sio and Thomas Ormerod. And we'll have a link to the paper. But cool. basically, yeah, they and took where, every where single... Are they, their institution? Where are they from? Uh, Utna Sio is in the University of Sheffield, or was. Um, there you go. And then Thomas is somewhere in the UK as well, I believe. Well, yeah. episode twenty-three, email. they will be guests yeah, on the show, to... or we'll yeah, skip episode not... twenty-four. I'm not sure whether Utna. No, see, I'm just going to say a full name because I'm not sure whether it's first or last or what. But um, Utna CEO has like all these really cool papers that I'm going to dive into as well around like um, how like quiet. I saw like one which was like how being quiet in team of team scenarios can be pretty useful for problem solving as a team and things like that. So anyway. Yeah, episode 20, she'll be on the show. Cool. Um, okay, yeah, so jumping into it, they uh, their findings was, yes, incubation is a good thing. So it turns out picking up a problem, okay. doing a little bit on the problem, and then moving away from that problem, doing something else, is a good thing. However, However. as you could have probably guessed, it heavily depends on what type of problem you are incubating and then how you incubate that problem as well. All right. So let's pull that apart. Uh, what kind of problems are good and what are not? So they divided it up into three types of problems. Well, really two types of problems. Um, one is called insight problems. So that's where you need to get to a specific solution. So think solving a crossword. Yeah. Or solving a mathematical proof okay the second type is what they dubbed creative problems which there isn't a single solution and generally the idea of quantity comes involved where there's lots of different ways to approach it and you need to then make a decision around what what way to do it yeah so those are the two types of problems uh within the insight problems they subclassified that again to visual problems and then linguistic problems but i don't think that I'll, I'll mention them further on but just remember inside problems is specific solution so your crossword and then a creative problem which is more day-to-day -day stuff because as generally there is no right single problem so they found that incubation after a long preparation period was generally good especially for creative problems so what's so the preparation period yeah. So actually, uh, let me jump back one step. Sorry, I'm, I'm too far down. Mm. Not only did they look at the type of problems and whether incubation was good, they looked at uh, what they call different moderators 
uh, and whether those things had an effect on the incubation effect. They called it the incubation effect, i.e. how better were you going to solve the problem? So the potential moderators that they looked at were the length of the incubation period. So like how long do you sit there thinking, how long do you leave between coming back to the problem? Mm -hmm. uh, preparation time. So that's like actually really, the preparation time was actually how much time you spent on the problem before you walked away from it and yeah. did something else. Exactly. So it actually isn't, you're not just preparing for the problem. You're actually, actually you're probably actually doing something on the problem as well. Yep. Uh, they then looked at the present, the presence of solution relevant cues. So like one of the studies had actually had the, it was like this nine dot problem where you had to like rearrange the dots in certain ways. And it actually had the solution sketched very faintly in the background. Um, mm -hmm. and so if you, if you, if you put, uh, if you put the solution in there or solution relevant cues, would that also affect the, inc did, uh, the incubation effect? And then also as well, they did the presence of misleading cues. So mm. would that, would incubation? Yeah. So okay, interesting. what the, what they found is that incubation after a long preparation period was generally good, especially for creative problems. Mm -hmm. so i mean to take that as an example let's say your creative problem is coming up with a great name for a podcast is that mm -hmm. like the is the incubation period like work on it maybe come up with some ideas write some things down brainstorm for a while and then just like stop and what, what do you do in the incubation mm -hmm. time and is that an important factor yeah yeah. Oh, sorry. They. Uh, sorry, I missed this one. <laughs> uh, and they also looked at the type of task during the incubation period, and they classified yeah. it into three different areas: rest, which is like sleep, mm -hmm. low cognitive load. So mm -hmm. that would be they. They put things like reading in that, which to me is not low cognitive. But anyway, they, it just they depends reading, what you're reading. But yeah. Yeah, and then high cognitive load, which is like basically go to another problem. Yeah. Okay. So they looked at those three different things. Um, so the creative problems were the ones that were definitely likely to have some incubation effect. And it mainly came from this long period of incu uh, they usually, and it usually came from this uh, long period of preparation. They weren't able to tell you how you should incubate because there weren't enough studies that looked at the differences between them. Mm-hmm. But um, but they did show that low low cognitive load rather than resting was much better for uh, insight problems, specifically linguistic problems. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So what that uh, and that kind of like debunked a little bit of a theory, which is that. Oh, you can't solve these problems because you're mentally fatigued. But yeah, I I remember uh, a while ago somebody did a big study into this idea of like uh, what do they call it, ego depletion and stuff, where like or decision fatigue and things, and and showed yeah. that it just wasn't real. Like people do get yeah, physiologically tired, but like there's not a yeah separate mental tiredness. Yeah, so they found that local, like the fact that you're better off doing a task rather than going and sleeping mm. for linguistic problems, which is an inside type of problem, kind of like debunks the idea that you can't solve it because your brain gets tired. It says you can't solve it for other reasons, mm. um, which I thought was really cool. Um they weren't, as I said, they weren't really able, to, really able to tell you what to do between for creative problems, but they did kind of hypothesize that low cognitive load tasks in between uh, as an incubation task would be really good. And they kind of realize, and the reason why they say that is a creative problem is they require multiple solutions usually, or multiple, or like a lot of thinking about what could be the different parts of the solution. And therefore, you have to do a lot of searching in your brain mm -hmm. for specific bits of knowledge. And so the idea is that, like, if you're there preparing longer, 
you're actually giving your brain the opportunity to like visit different areas and search within your own head for different types of knowledge that could be useful in solving the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, On the flip side for these insight problems, the preparation time was less important. And the reason is, unless, unless they found that the person got to a impasse or a block. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because of these insight problems usually used a very specific set of knowledge. You just had to explore that bit of knowledge. Like, you know, if you're playing Wordle, for example, you just need to think of five letter words over and over again. And until you get to an impasse where you physically couldn't think of a word that could fit, The, uh, mm. the incubation there's probably going to be less effective, which I thought was really cool. It's like the reason why creative problems have this benefit, this effect is because you need to be able to, and preparation time is important. You need to like scrape every part of your brain for potential different things that could uh, mash together towards the solution. Whereas in very task specific insight problems, mm. you don't need to do that unless you hit a block. Yeah, I mean, like, and I mean this purely as an analogy, not as some description of the physiology, but, you know, it almost feels like your brain, so, you you know, if you imagine it as a bucket and in the creative task, Mm -hmm. you're just, like, pouring more and more stuff into that bucket. And when it gets full, like, you just can't physically add more stuff. And similarly with the uh, insight problem, you're trying stuff, and that's taken up space in that bucket and then it gets full. And it's, it's, it's almost like having that incubation period or that hammock period just empties out the bucket. And maybe there was stuff queued up waiting to jump in the bucket and maybe not, but it just seems to sort of make room. And in the creative sense, it's like, oh yeah, I might try some new ideas now that the bucket's emptying out. And in the insight one, it's like, all right, I'm out of my loop of just thinking of, you know, all the words that end in GHT. Uh, I'll come back to it. Yeah. Yeah, so to round off this creative problem thing, they were able to show that low cognitive or rest was better than high load incubation. So you're better off doing reading a book or going and having a nap uh, rather than switching tasks and go to another problem, but they weren't able to show any difference between, um, but that would seem to be from a number of studies, not because there was, uh, there was some inherent difference between the non-inherent difference between the two. Um, so yeah, creative problems. So, which is, I think is the most applicable to what we do every single day is incubation is good, but make sure you spend enough time on the problem to be able to really digest the problem. And as you said, fill that bucket up. And I mean, was there any information in the study on how long those times were? Was it? There... No, and this is the problem. So, because uh, all the studies were different, like in some studies, five minutes was considered lo- short and then long in others. So generally what they did was uh, they looked for uh, re- incubation versus prep- preparation time as a ratio. Um, and so long was generally above one like the ratio was one so for example if you spend an hour on the problem incubate for more than an hour Mm. i mean it's it's a fascinating idea and it pertains to like work yeah yeah like are we really getting the best out of people just asking them to slam at a problem for eight hours yeah exactly maybe a bit of lunch or a blend 43 mixed in in the middle of the day like probably not hey <laughs> yeah, no, but it, uh, I remember we saw some article about some guys crazy, like yeah, called him the circle, the circles that he operated in, where he'd like crunch for an hour and a half and then just take an hour off, and that was his day all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have that open on my iPad, so I'll tell you. No, no. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it. show notes. <laughs> it's something like my admittedly crazy work routine or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a good yeah, post. Um, and there are days when I do that, like, you know, cause our schedules are kind of wild, you know, both being cross time zone. So when the day starts at like 5am for a meeting and ends at like 7pm, it's not really sustainable to work nonstop. So yeah. 
I don't know. I, I, I found it interesting. Um, I think one of the tough things is like often the task I'm working on before the break and after is, is different. So like I'll block up my day and yeah. be like, okay, do emails and then do, you know, work on this AI that we're developing or, you know, catch yeah. up with the team or whatever. But I think it's good. I mean, the other thing I think, I can't remember if we talked about this on the podcast or just you and me chatting, but I really feel like, you know, you said what, 6,000 patients total? Uh, 3,600. 3,600 patients, like, uh, or participants, we should say. They're not sick people. Um, that's not really that many. And no, it, this it is really, over like 50 years as well. Yeah. It really makes me think again, like, just how interesting video games is as a platform for this sort of investigation. Yeah. Like you could very easily design this experiment in a very controlled environment and run this as a test and see what comes out the other side. Um, yeah. And you could, you know, change the type of problem. You could change the incubation period, the difficulty of the incubation task, the time period. Yeah. Um, I just yeah. Do you think what? Do you think Wordle is some giant experiment because you can only play once per day? Well, and you have to sit. The- <laughs> uh, no, but uh, New York Times crossword is a little bit like this. I do it sometimes. I'm admittedly not you very. Do the, good. You, you yeah. do the New York Times crossword. Yeah, yes, and I do the New York Times crossword. Oh, cute. Do you have it? Yeah. Well, I, I I'll I'll admit, dear New York Times fanatic listeners. I have the like auto check mode on uh, because I'm admittedly not the greatest speller. And also, also known as coward mode. Yeah, coward mode. I'm having to admit I'm in coward mode. Um, but it's quite fun. And uh, yeah. I've definitely, you know, like I'll do a few words and then I'll come back to it later and do a few more. And I, I don't know. I've had those moments where it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's another good example of just like video games as a, an opportunity for it. Yeah. But that is a insight problem. And so you should only have the incubation when you've hit an impasse. That's true. And that is usually when I get frustrated and put it away and do something else for a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so those are the creative problems, mm. which is prep time then have a have a bit of a relax and then uh low cognitive or rest is better than high cognitive so don't don't task switch yeah i mean i would say though that like everyday work for most people is probably a blend right like yeah very few of us are professional you know new york time crossworders for a living nor are we like Mm. purely you know creation driven I wonder how that, I guess, you know, it's probably hard to control for, but I'd say very little of what I do could easily be put into one of those two categories completely. Yeah. And I also think it's interesting when you like bring the like manager versus maker distinction into this as well, Mm. which is the, like when you're in maker mode, are you making, is it like, are you, are you on an insight problem? Yeah. That is actually interesting. Like, yeah. yeah, and like obviously there, there, there's room for in your manager mode, you're probably more likely to go to be on creative problem mode. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. I w- yeah. Hmm. That's cool. That is cool. Yeah. And I'll just write. I'll round off a round off this here with a bit of the insight problems. So with the linguistic problems, mm. they found that low demand tasks was just absolutely best compared to rest or high demand, which is interesting. Um, so uh, go play a computer game rather than go take a nap and don't go work on other things. If you're trying to solve your, uh, if you're that trying is to solve interesting, your yeah. Um, and I mean, for dum dums like me, what, what's a linguistic problem? Yeah, linguistic problem is uh, if I give you three example that was given was I give you three words and you need to find a fourth word to link them. So, oh, okay, link those three words together. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
then interestingly as well with linguistic problems, mis putting in misleading cues, if you had an incubation period, mm. you would have, there would be a bigger effect, i.e. you'd be better off solving the problem if there was misleading information in it. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. And so there's this, there's 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 a couple of there's a couple of like schools of thought in this area. One is that like your brain will have time to analyze and discard irrelevant information, which will then allow things to go through, or your brain will forget things. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. It's almost as if you know. Back to this bucket analogy. Like it, <laughs> the bucket analogy kind of falls over. It's like it's selectively it knows what to get rid of. You know, it's like it's the yeah. bucket analogy, but there's oil in the water uh, and, you know, it settles and separates and then you can pour one off. I'm, yeah. I'm really trying to stick to this bucket analogy. <laughs> <laughs> dig in, dig in. Um, so, yeah, that's that's linguistic problems. So if you're solving your Wordle, mm -hmm. go play a computer game. Don't, uh, don't go have a nap. Hmm. Um. And then the final problem, which is the visual problems. And these were like, these These seem to be the problems that had the least impact from an incubation period. There was only really, uh, there was only really an incubation effect when it, uh, from preparation, when an impasse was reached. So uh, they called it the nine dot problem where you like got to get nine dots and get them in specific orders. So like, just imagine like, you know, those matchstick games where you got to try and get matchsticks to, to yeah. it's like kind of yep. solving a puzzle. It's only when an impasse was reached did preparation time affect it. And it was ide this idea then that um, because it's an insight problem and you're in a very specific domain of knowledge, until you reach an impasse, you should just exhaust that specific bit of knowledge and then you should go let it incubate so you can then start to think and jump, uh, jump into different knowledge, let your brain jump into different knowledge domains. Yeah. That's interesting stuff. I mean, all right, let's let's bring this this back. I mean, fascinating paper and it's awesome that they brought together so many different studies. Yeah. If you had to like distill this into, you know, Tom's week next week is gonna look different based on this knowledge. Yeah, yeah hypothetical or not, what are you changing? Yeah, I, I think to me is that like one is understand understand which problem you want to incubate spend yeah. some time on it and then be prepared to come back to it at some point in the future like like i would pick a problem spend an hour on it two hours on it and then come back to it be prepared to come back to it the next day during that time i'd have a bit of i'd do other tasks during that time, I'd have some low rest cognitive and I'd have some low, some low cognitive load task uh, incubation. I'd have some rest incubation. But to me, it's like, okay, create a problem, which is what I mostly do during work, uh, is pick a problem and like prep, do some prep on it, which is spend some time on the problem, actively spend some time on it, and then be prepared to come back to it. Do Don't reckon, expect to solve it in that time. You reckon even the next day? Yeah. You can come mm. back in the afternoon if you wanted. Yeah, yeah. I, I do wonder, like, if there's an upper limit on incubation time. Was there anything in the yeah. work on that? Uh, they didn't say. Yeah. Either way. I mean, you've got to think theoretically there must be because if you come back yeah. to a problem in, like, 18 years, you're likely yeah. forgotten. So there must exist an upper yeah. limit somewhere. And there, there, there was an element of, well, the way they wrote it is, like, dipping in and out of the problem, like, just, like, doing it for a bit taking a break and then dipping back in and like, you know, yeah. every time you revisit, you, you might like trigger a new part of your brain. Um, I don't know. So like if I was going to do the crazy version of my week, it would be like line up all my creative problems, mm -hmm. spend an hour on them, go play a computer game for an hour and then come back and spend an hour on them. And if uh, learn, like, if I solve it, I solve it. If I don't, I don't, and go for another hour break. That'd be the crazy version of the week. Yeah. And in between, you don't do emails. You don't do. Mm. Yeah, you don't do emails. You don't do other creative problems. You just put them in a list and work your way through them. And when they're solved, you, they're solved. 
what you just made me think of was, uh, you know, the, the, all that work around space repetition. Uh, yeah. When you're talking about dipping your toes in the water, it, it makes me wonder if there's an effect here of when you're first tackling the problem, maybe you come back to it after an hour. And then once you've done that second work session, maybe two hours is fine. And then four hours and then eight hours. And you know, maybe the longer you've been cycling, the longer you can leave in between these sessions before that expiry period, or maybe the longer you yeah. should leave between sessions. Yeah. Rick had, anyway, Rick, Rick, whatever our, our hammock driven development guy. Yeah. He, um, I talked about like handing over the problem to your brain. And I think mm -hmm. I actually like originally tried to like find for this week. I was like, how the hell do you hand a problem over to your brain? Like, what's a good way to do that? Yeah. And obviously spending time on it, but like, and I, I think like, obviously it's a function of time. So spending time on it is important. And if you like regularly dip your toes back in, you're probably going to let your brain know that this is important to you. Yeah. I mean, not to be that guy, because it seems to be a hot topic at the moment, but like you do have to wonder in that mild cognitive task category whether like doom scrolling Twitter falls into that category or whether that yeah. pulls you in a different direction. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know what low cognitive means, but I think like... To me, there's a an element of consistency in the thinking, so your brain can like. And this is where psychology gets dangerous because everyone's an armchair psychologist. Is like, so your brain can like figure out the task or what it's meant to be doing, and just kind of just do that, and then it knows it's doing that. Whereas if you're, uh, I don't know whether I'm just saying scrolling Twitter is bad because I feel like I've got that, you know, the oh, your kids need to get outside and play with the ball mentality. <laughs> Well, I mean, to, to, to bring a little bit more potential science to it, I wonder if, I mean, one of the reasons why doom scrolling sucks is like there's such a strong emotional response. And I wonder mm -hmm. whether, you know, in, again, you know, we, should, we should have Tom on this show sometime to talk us out of these stupid yeah. uh, uh, rabbit holes. But, I mean, you can imagine that, highly charged emotional situations are likely to like switch off the logical part of your brain and turn you more into like flight or fight mode. Yeah. So, you know, it'd be interesting to know whether doom scrolling Twitter and getting that emotional yeah. response because somebody's, uh, you know, said something awful or, you know, whatever yeah. or the Senate has, you know, repealed some bill and, you know, made some disgusting decision. Again, not a political podcast, but uh, yeah, I wonder whether that has any effect. Yeah. Well, um, I'm just reading here. It says high demand tasks should fully occupy the individual's mind and prevent further conscious work on the unsolved problem. Hmm, that's low cognitive demand no. tasks that do not require individuals to focus their conscious attention on task performance have reported similar benefits. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, go. Alrighty. Your turn. My turn. Yeah. Us. So, uh, this article, I very I prepared. Think I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Look, this was a late entry to the the article game. I'll be honest. Um, I made what, I made Elliot go on a walk and figure out what he was going to talk about. Yeah, and look, if I'm being totally honest, I just listened to a comedy podcast. Uh, shout out to Hello from the Magic Tavern. Definitely get on that. And uh, found this article when I got home, waiting for Tom to get his camera on. Uh, but I had read this earlier in the week. I just didn't have it saved uh, to talk about. But I found it while doom scrolling on Twitter in between uh, problem solving. And it's... Incubating. Uh, <laughs> incubating. Yeah, yeah, I was I was incubate scrolling on Twitter. <laughs> Who's that pup? Uh, and yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't want to call it an expose. It's an article. It's a, it's a news article about a DEA investigation into uh, improper prescription of Adderall, Ritalin, and a number of other ADHD drugs. So to give everyone listening the background, uh, 
pre-COVID, but really taking a big uptick during COVID, there are these companies, uh, as I've seen just in California, but they may exist elsewhere, uh, that are sort of online uh, mental health help, uh, but with the ability to prescribe. So you can uh, sign up. Uh, probably wrangle your insurer. I don't really know how the payment works in these, but it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, get matched with a clinician who will then walk you through the diagnostic process and potentially prescribe you uh, one of these drugs. And, you know, Ritalin, Adderall, these ADHD drugs, like they're stimulants, they're, they're amphetamines. So, an average person uh, who doesn't have a diagnosis of ADHD is going to see a performance improvement taking these drugs. That's why, you know, roughly a third of American adults are on one of these drugs and not through a prescription. Um, college students use them, high school students use them uh, because they are performance enhancing. Uh, but they also do have a real therapeutic effect. Uh, on people with ADHD and, you know, similar drugs for a number of other um, mental health conditions that can, you know, have, have quite a strong effect on people's lives. And you know, I think that the point to explore here, which I find interesting, is did they do something wrong? Yeah, I, assuming they acted correctly. Let's Let's just put aside the idea that maybe they're just like handing out Riddle in left, right, and center. But yeah, you know, assuming there's a proper clinical review and a relationship and it's the same stuff you would do in person but online, is this bad? Um, because, you know, I know uh, having looked into, you know, talking to a professional about mental health issues in the past, you know, some of this stuff is, you know, six month wait times if you're lucky. Uh, and, you know, for ADHD or for depression or for anxiety, that can mean for a lot of people a long period of having a real tough time. And on the one hand, to me, access is great. Getting more people the help that they need seems like a really good thing. But on the other, like, I'm not going to lie, I can see the potential for abuse because especially these heavily funded high growth companies there is always a pressure to grow and you know there are certain conditions where you can't grow beyond a certain threshold you know you can't diagnose more cancers than there are people with cancer unless you lie which you shouldn't do but given the way that a lot of these mental health conditions are diagnosed you know there is the opportunity to you know, tick a few boxes right of center and say, yeah, this is definitely. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the gray area is long, big and murky. Yeah. And it, it to me, it's such an interesting point in that, like, you know, on the one hand, there's this potential for abuse. And on the other hand, there's the potential to give a lot of people critical services that they can't otherwise get. And how given that the future of medicine is likely to be vir <laughs> oh, loud, uh, virtual, how do we balance this? So let's play, let's go, let's go either side of the spectrum here. So like if not, if these drugs exist, there are a lot of people with issues that will never be medicated and that's bad. What if everyone was on these drugs? Like what, what, what's the downside? Why aren't we all on them? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, some of it, you know, you look at you look at drugs like alcohol and uh, caffeine and all these others, and like they sort of, I mean, most of these are classified based on the potential for harm and the potential for addiction, uh, and whether that be a lifestyle addiction or a chemical addiction, uh, a lot of these drugs are up there. Uh, I mean, mm. the close cousins of the prescribed amphetamines are things like methamphetamine. 
uh, and we know that that can do a lot of damage and that can be highly addictive. Um, so, you know, they're not in the heroin, methamphetamine category. They're in the, we need to control access to these because there's a potential for abuse. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, who, I don't know. It's like that <laughs> that post that goes around every now and then, which is like, why don't we have an Olympics where everybody can take as many performance enhancing drugs as they can and we just like see how far humans can go um mm. yeah i mean well because a lot of a lot of them have severe side effects on the yeah. longevity of you as you yeah 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 absolutely absolutely but yeah i mean look it's an interesting question like should people be able to and can people reasonably weigh up the pros and cons of these yeah. without a advanced degree in that field i don't know it's hard to say yeah so like to me like it's less about like should this be the olympics with performance uh, yeah, enhancing or like, is, is, is this more like you know fluoride in the drinking water where like mm. for a long time everyone was worried about it um I, I also remember reading some crazy story about how some guy just like spiked the whole town's water supply because he believes so much in it and just yeah. put fluoride in the river. Yeah, I'll yeah. find that one. And then, but like, you know, is this like, should should we be low dosage putting Adderall into our drinking water? Uh, or is there, a, is there a complete benefit to it? Or is like... Um, let me, let me pull up. So uh, where I'm going right now, on the other screen is examine.com. If you haven't seen this, it's a really great website for sort of peer reviewed analysis of these. And mm -hmm. I don't want to speak out of turn. So I will look up uh, one of these drugs and have a look at what uh, the reported side effect profile is. But I don't know. Um, oh. Pop. So I'm just reading about fluoride, and it turns out that it uh it came from the uh, in Colorado where they called it the Colorado brown stain, which is people in certain parts of Colorado had dental fluorosis, um, where they were consuming way too much fluoride, uh, so their teeth were cracked and were full of pock marks, but none of them had cavities. <laughs> There you go. Uh, so Colorado Browns. As far as I can it. see, examine.com does not have anything on Adderall or Ritalin, potentially because it is a controlled substance. Uh, but, well, I mean, I say this with a pinch of salt, like there must be a reason it's a controlled substance, but then I think like there's a lot of stuff that was a controlled substance. Mm -hmm and then suddenly slid into not a controlled substance like marijuana and increasingly psychedelics. So yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Like, should everybody be yeah. taking out a role? You know, what, what's the blend 43,000, which is, you know, instead of the caffeine, it's, uh, it's just got low doses of, uh, amphetamines in it. Maybe, uh, yeah. you know, I, yeah, we should probably say at some point, like, none of this is medical advice. We're fucking stupid. Don't listen to us. Uh, especially around this. Like, we we know a lot about what we know about, but this isn't one of them. Uh, talk to a doctor. Um, but So, so what, yeah. what... All right, you keep going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, coming back to it, like, uh, I guess, yeah, pretty directly. What do you think? Like, should this stuff... Should you be able to go online, talk to a clinician, and get a prescription for Adderall, or is that like too risky? Uh, well, as someone who runs a virtual service company, like a virtual healthcare company, my answer is obviously yes. You should be able to do this and seek out healthcare yourself. I, I, I but like to me, like under what conditions are they acting in bad faith? Like, what is when they're well? We do cancer, right? So it's kind of it's not simple, but it's easier where it's, yes, they do have cancer. No, they don't have cancer. Yeah. There is a pretty cut and dry pathological measure for whether someone has cancer or not. Um, that's not the case here. 
and so the gray area like is the confusing bit um like they're obviously acting in bad faith if it's anyone who comes on they they hand out adhd drugs or they hand out these controlled substances yeah when they give them a diagnosis um but if they're operating in a way that is what the current healthcare system has deemed appropriate at scale, then why wouldn't we do it? Especially when there's six months wait times, um, mm. especially when there's like people that just went through an incredibly tumultuous period of their life, like, uh, like a literal generational defining period of their life where people were locked away from their friends and their family for a year, but expected to maintain their education, maintain their professionalism and maintain their uh, socializing um, during a time when they weren't able to do any of that. So um, I think, and, and as well, like from what people are talking about in terms of mental health problems, you would expect diagnoses and therefore prescriptions for treatment to go up during this period so like on the surface i'm okay with it but i i think it'll in reality what's happening uh, what i imagine is happening is that there is a few bad actors both in all of the companies and in and particular companies that are chasing growth too aggressively yeah um i think as well it's obviously not a good spot good spot to be in when the incentives are completely aligned uh, could lead to, uh, in one direction um so yeah i i think i, I i'm going to give a boring answer where i think i think they're fine but i also think it's okay to put a lot of scrutiny over the top of this from from an investigative personal uh, investigation so you might say that these companies have therapeutic benefit but high potential for abuse <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, feel, I feel mostly the same way like uh, I just think so many people have way less healthcare than they need to have. Um, but naturally, like, yeah, there is a need to be cautious. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, should... like, the, the wider sort of medical fraternity doesn't move at the same speed as Silicon Valley. So, you know, 20 years from now, do I think that, most of these prescriptions and appointments will happen online. Yeah, absolutely. But like there may be some uh, bloodshed in the first few iterations. Yeah. Should we do what all podcasts do, which is take an incredibly complex nuanced situation and solve it with a few armchair philosophical uh, wishy-washy statements? Yes. So, in this situation, like to me, this is more of a symptom of mm -hmm. of an of of an issue rather than causing the issue. And to me, it's like, why are there? And the symptom here, like these companies have popped up, is because there is a restriction to accessing care. Yep. Why is there a restriction to accessing care? Why are people paying money to jump the queue? Yeah. To get. Yeah, yeah. And like we're coming back to like, system. oh, yeah. Turns out healthcare delivering healthcare, which is an incredibly complex thing, on mass to entire populations, is a is a bit of a tricky beast to do. Healthcare is hard. You had it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it only took us five episodes to solve this problem, but you could say yeah. we were incubating in between. No, what do we need to say here? We need to say that, like, we just need the market to solve it. We just need to let the marketplace solve yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, yeah. <laughs> Let's have a million of these companies and a million DEAs all run privately and the free market will sort this out. It sorts everything out. Yeah. Yeah. Tune in next week to hear more about my uh, upcoming crypto, uh, my upcoming M NFT drop. Mm, next week's disclaimers are financial. Yeah. Uh <laughs> Yeah, but man, it's it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see where it lands and like what sort of precedent it sets. Um, not yeah. that precedents mean anything anymore. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, they get described as pill farms and 
that's not a good name to have. You don't want to be described as a pill farm. But you think, like, I think a lot of it also comes back to, yeah, just the blurriness of diagnosis. Like, if having ADHD caused your nose to fall off, it'd be pretty hard to, like, rock up and say, like, oh, yeah, definitely have that. Can I have some? Yeah. Um, but it's it's not like that. We you know we don't have. Yeah. If you if you look at the markers for ADHD and these these sort of tests <laughs> that the the DSM uses, most people will have experienced some of those symptoms at some point in their life. Yeah. Do you think it's an issue with the over treatment or an issue with the definition of a diagnosis? Well, I can't listen. Do you reckon that everyone has it? Uh, not everyone has it, and they're prescribing stuff to people that don't have it, or it's this gray area of diagnosis and they can kind of everyone, like, you know, everyone's been anxious and depressed and probably exhibited ADHD symptoms in their lifetime. If you read the like depression symptoms, it's like, Oh yeah, I did all that by 10 AM, but I'm probably not clinically depressed. Yeah. Look, I think the way that we've structured medicine and overall, I think it's a net positive is to, get very precise and quantifiable definitions of things. So diagnoses are, you know, take some of the tissue and look at it under a microscope and classify the cells as cancerous or not. And I think in ADHD, as a, you know, just use one example, the diagnosis is a bit blurry and there are alternative therapies uh, which are non-medicated. But they're also mm. blurry. They're a lot harder to quantify. And frankly, they take a lot more work uh, from the individual. And it's a lot tidier. I'm not saying it's better, but it's tidier to write a prescription. Because that is a, mm. a fact that you can put in a medical record and say, here is a quantitative dot point about what happened. Mm. what are the what are the other treatment methods for there's a lot of like like, cognitive behavioral therapy and uh that's just that's just psychology for that's medical talk for med some form of meditation right like it's like oh yeah but it's like like witnessing thoughts right yeah you know if tim ferris's philosophy and lifestyle was like distilled into medical form which is like analyze your life, optimize, but, you know, do all that sort of stuff. You know, the, the sort of spreadsheet mentality, uh, it's kind of a little bit of that. It's like self-reflection yeah. and, and also like lifestyle adaptation. You know, ADHD, for example, is like uh, problems in executive function. Uh, so it's like, okay, what can you do? Like, what can you do to minimize distraction and what can you do to, you know, maximize your ability to stay on task or whatever else. And I mean, that, that article that we talked about earlier, which was the 90 minutes on 60 minutes off, uh, was that author's example of how to, uh, have a productive work day, given that he has a diagnosis of ADHD, if I'm remembering that correctly. So it's things like that. Mm. Okay, cool. Yeah, but an interesting one. And if you know, if I see what happens in the end, we'll definitely talk about it on a future episode. But I think we are coming up to time. So boom, boom, boom. anything you want to plug this week, man? What's what's going on? What's good? Uh, I'm 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 going to be sending out my first book summary. I've been writing summaries of the books that I read. Um, I did good to great by mm-hmm. Jim Coles. Turns out it was a great book. Really enjoyed it. Did it start um, just sort of okay and then get better? No, it started strong and ended strong. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, no, I think it tailed off towards the end, but that was probably because I was reading the appendix and I didn't realize that I was reading the appendix. Okay. Great to good then. <laughs> yeah. Um, that'll, be, that'll be my only plug. Um, oh, I'm on to my, mex- my next Brandon Sanderson, Warbreaker. Mm-hmm. It's good. It is good, man. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I think after Elantris, I read the the first Miss Bourne trilogy. Yeah, that is some good storytelling. 
Like, yeah. yeah. That's that's next for me. Yeah. I think as well, I, I listened to a podcast with Brandon Sanderson and it's like, Elantris was like his sixth book, but it was the first published. Like, that dude, and, it, and then he published like another five books before he was considered successful and then another 10 before he was considered a bestseller. Like, that dude, when people say they want to write a book, like, yeah, they don't. Man. They don't like, want to be Brandon Sanderson. Yeah, he has a yeah like, amazing. Dude, he grinded a long time. Yeah, hundred percent. And man, like, you know, hit me up once you've read two dozen of his books, and we can start trolling the wiki together and point out all the weird like cross book law and all this sort of stuff. Uh, because Did it you is know he has his own wild. internal wiki. He has his own internal wiki that only him and his company, like his team, are able to access about everything. I can't wait for the day that he like retires because he'll release it. Like he's that kind yeah, of yeah. That's right? wild. That is absolutely wild. Yeah. And and you know, uh, reading a lot of the acknowledgements in his book, uh, just tying this back into the previous content, like he has consultants yeah. on like mental health and all this sort of stuff, so like he can write effectively from the perspective of people who are like yeah. you know suffering from depression and all this sort of stuff. Like the amount of work that must go into those books is just phenomenal. Have you heard his schedule? Uh, maybe a long time ago. So he gets up at about 3 p.m. That's um, chill. And we'll like, or well, maybe it's 1 p.m. And then he'll kind of like do his breakfasty, lunchy thing and then crush out a session of, uh, like he'll kind of do like admin in the morning or something. And then, you know, play with the kids and have dinner with the family. And then he'll go, right. And he'll do his first writing block of two hours mm -hmm. and then he'll come back, put the kids to bed and then go for a second session and then of writing and then we'll probably call it quits at the end of the second session. But the second session is kind of like it can go as long as he wants. And then he'll pens down and he'll just hang out for a bit until like four or 5 a.m. And then go to bed. Incubating, man. Uh, yeah, like. Uh, he and he's just like well work, he because he worked night shifts while he was um writing his first books uh, and he picked night shifts so he could write while he picked a hotel that he could write at while he was doing the night shift um and he's just like yeah night works for me so that's my schedule okay very cool yeah yeah good dude good dude prolific neil gaiman's also a neil gaiman who's another author uk mm. author is also very like his best work is 9 p.m. onwards kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I can get behind that, man. Like, a topic for another day, but, yeah, 9 to 5 does seem like a somewhat arbitrary, perhaps factory-driven schedule uh, as opposed to <laughs> optimized for human consumption. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I yeah, would like to plug the video game Northgard. Uh, it's... Uh, Tom and I are in anticipation of the, the June Spice Wars game that's coming out, uh, and it's from the same developers that uh, developed this game, Northguard. Uh, the developers are uh, Shiro Games. Uh, it's a sort of Viking-based real-time strategy cross 4X, so sort of Age of Empires cross civilization type game, uh, and... I watched a couple of videos on the June Spice Wars game and thought, yeah, that looks cool. I like those guys. So I, I'd had this game for a while, re-downloaded it, been playing it a little bit after the work day is yeah. done. Uh, and it's really good. You should check it out if you haven't played it before. Yeah. yeah. I reckon I will. Cool. All right, good stuff. Well, if you've stuck with us to the end, uh, the secret code is 6417983. And if you put that in on our website, you gain access to uh, an instant. Elliot's bank accounts. Yeah. It's Brandon Sanderson's <laughs> secret wiki uh, and any prescription that you want. Uh, and just don't listen to anything I've what said. Was, what was our five episode milestone? What we say we do if we hit five episodes? Uh, I, said I'd, I said I'd listen to all of our podcasts back to back. Yes. Yeah, look, anyone who's legitimately made this far, if you have any suggestions for what we could be doing to do better, pop them in the comments. Gently. 
There's no smash them into Don't the say less rambling, though. Uh, smash that. Because we want to get better. We want to make these fun. Uh, and we'll be trying a few things. Uh, I have a couple of ideas about what we might do, but uh, you'll have to stick around and subscribe to see them. But with that, we bid you farewell. This should come out early next week. Uh, and until then, have a good one. Goodbye, friends. See you, everyone.